Hello and welcome to, well, the Suez Crisis, 1956, and what happens if it goes hot? Well, welcome to the long troll version of it. And I have to admit, I have taken my time in getting around to recording this long patrol because it was rather nice having it as a research topic. It was rather nice thinking about it. But all good things must eventually come to an end, and a video will not appear if it is not recorded. So, even though I am out of iron brew, the last bottle is being saved for the downhill history. Uh, the Norway 1940 on ne next Wednesday. When this comes out. But, I have water. In an Eeyore mug. Which pretty much spits as... 90% of the reason for sewers is lots of people be digging their heels in and being stubborn as mules. <coughs> and it's time to discuss. The sewers crisis going hot in 1956. So, I'm going to expand that a little bit. And I'm going to be lazy and stick my feet up. Because it's that time at night and i feel like having my feet up i'm also going to turn the gain up a bit and the volume up a bit on the mic just to make it a tad more smooth it's always fun to sort of check these things out and make sure everything's working properly so, the 1956 Suez Crisis. And the challenge was, what happens if it goes hot? Well, there's one scenario, the two options for it going hot are very simple. Either America gets involved, or Russia gets involved. The Soviet Union, as it was in 1956. And whilst America was applying economic pressures to Britain and France, and diplomatic ones, I don't see them in 1956 actually going to war, even over Egypt and the Suez Canal. There's a level beyond, you know, there is applying economic sanctions, that's fine. Going to war, that's a big thing. Threatening nuclear weapons against your allies, well, that's a good way to lose basing rights in Europe. And you're depending on Britain and France shoring up West Germany, and you're depending on them for NATO. So, basically, if you do that, you're breaking up NATO, which you've just spent a lot of effort building. So I don't see that happening. But, potentially, there is the Soviet Union. Potentially. Unlikely. Why? Because their navy is pitiful at this time still. Still going up, and they're just not in a position to do it. So here's some background. NASA is the president of Egypt, has come to power thanks to various uh, revolution. Revolution which was very much anti-colonial and Arabic nationalism. But, well, Egyptian nationalism. But he exists by playing off the USA versus the USSR. The USA is trying to organize a Middle East defense organization on parallel with NATO. And they see e Amer America sees Egypt as a key part of this. The trouble is for the Americans is that for the Ara Arabic countries and for the Middle East, 
There are three things which rank higher than the Cold War. There is Israel. There is the competition for who's going to be the big top dog in the Arab world. And there is the nationalism, anti-colonialism, which often get combined together. And then the Cold War comes a distant fourth, possibly fifth or sixth below economic development and what the president or prime minister or king of that country's had for breakfast that morning. It's something the Americans really can't understand, but and it's kind of difficult to sometimes explain to classes these days because the traditional idea is that the Cold War is globally dominant as a political factor in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The reality is it's globally dominant in the worldview of countries which ascribe to it or are concerned with it. To countries who don't give a flying hoot, who merely see it as an opportunity and actually have other more pressing concerns in their mind that they're worried about, it becomes background mood music. And that's the case that you have going on here. You also have some interesting factors in that there is the Baghdad Pact in 1955, which does become the Middle East Treaty Organization, or MITO, and then CENTO, um, which is all the British sponsored, eff a sponsored effort, centered on, really, on Iraq. <sighs> it built a railway, it built some scientific links. It was quite successful, but again, in many ways, the American urging and trying to push the British out of the Middle East actually undermined it, and their own organization failed. So, hey ho, ideology over pragmatism seems to be triumphing there. It's the Middle East is not a mess, okay? Please stop thinking that. And it isn't a mess in the 1950s. The Middle East has its own priorities. And yes, there are states in it which are very close to failed state status. There are states which, frankly, would possibly be better run if they were run by a mafia organization. And there are states who have only a nodding acquaintance with decent government. But there are states which are not any of those things, which are fairly decently organized, which are fairly representatively run. You might not like their governments if you're from the West or from other countries, but that's neither here nor there. It's the people who ultimately choose their government if they're given the option to choose them. They're not given the option to choose them, then their choice is to put up with it or revolt. Again, or not always the most palatable options, because revolutions don't tend to always promote the best people to the leadership roles. Either way, the Middle East is complicated, and there are lots of different treaties going on. One of the interesting things is that you're often expected to say that the moment the, Anglo the Egyptian Revolution happens in 1952, that suddenly the British relations with Egypt go south. Well, they go south, but they managed to actually create an agreement in 1954. But the thing is, the British are pretty much using that um, Arab own Cold War of who's going to be the leading nation of the Arab world, uh, and the dispute that brings between Egypt, Iraq, 
Iran, Saudi Arabia, to play them off against each other for Britain's own security and success. It's a very pragmatic approach. Not a particularly nice one, but it's pragmatic. So this, of course, is an amphibious assault. And it uses a lot of equipment which was being built at the end of World War II. Honestly, there isn't anything else really being built. The Allies, Britain, France, America, whatever you want, have largely been living off what they are building at the end of World War II as it was fairly good equipment and none of them really has the money for more. They have too much other stuff they're having to invest in. Amphibious equipment isn't going to be replaced. And so you have a classic example of a landing ship tank. Putting ashore a centurion. That's who is. And one of the interesting things to realize is that as a whole, the Suez operation is incredibly half-hearted. Incredibly half-hearted compared to what the British and the French could have put in, compared to what they could have inflicted on the Egyptian forces if they'd been going for it. It is incredibly half-hearted. So, now here's the first interesting thing. NATO. NATO is, of course, this amazing thing of which America is a cornerstone today, and we all associate NATO with America. NATO's roots are the Anglo-French Treaty of Dunkirk, which is declared in 1947, two years before the North Atlantic Treaty is signed. Now, the Anglo-French Treaty is basically the Treaty of Dunkirk is, uh, if Russia can decide to break out of Germany and continue on to try and forcefully bring everyone under communist control, we are allies. We will come to your aid. Basically, it's the 1947 equivalent of the Entente Cordiale, without Russia as the third partner. And with Britain even more laughing at the French, going, yes, we'll come to your aid. Done it twice before. Yeah, we'll do it again. Prefer not to, though. We prefer it not to happen. In 1949, they formed the North Atlantic Treaty. That's lovely, that stuff. When we celebrate it. Honestly, NATO, as you understand it, does not form in 1949. There is its Korean War. It is the Korean War and the realization of how hot the Cold War could actually get. That means in 1951 they set up SHAPE, the strategic headquarters, and in 1952 a Secretary General is appointed. Here's the interesting thing. West Germany joins on the 6th of May, 1955, joins NATO. So NATO's reaching, starting to expand really dramatically. And the United States, the Soviet Union, therefore, creates the Warsaw Pact on the 14th of May, 1955. Now, I know they're all communist countries. And I know there are lots of, uh, you can make a lot of things on paper without making them reality. But the Warsaw Pact becomes very solid in coordination and command structure wise very, very quickly. So I'm sorry, but they had everything in place. The Warsaw Pact no more came into existence on the 14th of May. Then NATO came into existence in 1949. It's just one took a while to get started and one was already in existence by the time they declared it. <sighs> and I include this picture just because you uh, people think that present signing treaties is something that's become photogenically obsessive recently. 
No, it isn't. And it's also the period where they pick up the habit of doing that thing where they sign one letter with one pen, then hand it off, and then another letter with another pen, and hand it off, and another letter with another pen, and then hand it off, and you just go, oh, you... why? What a waste of pens. <sighs> the grand fight. Various soviet oriented equipment, but actually Czechoslovakian. Okay? So, here's the thing. America and the Western powers are curiously restrictive when it comes to selling arms. They want to know what you're planning on doing with them, and preferably that you're not going to use them to start attacking Israel. Can't think why, but they've decided that might not be popular at home, so they'd rather ask you in advance and you say no. If you don't say no, they don't sell them to you. But you want to get new arms. Where are you going to get them from? Well, the Soviet Union can't really sell them to you. If it does, that could be directly interfering in the Cold War. And that would look bad. Thank God for Marshal Tito and Czechoslovakia. Because you can buy them from Czechoslovakia. They can be delivered in ships registered in the Soviet Union. But they're not Soviet equipment. So they're not directly supplying you. If you don't think the Soviet Union's yaying and agreeing with it, then that's your luck out, because I can guarantee they probably are. So, let's consider President Nasser. Ooh. One of arguably the best politicians of the Cold War, period. Um, not a particularly nice individual. I don't think anyone who gets to that sort of position is particularly nice. Probably personable enough, but um, very decent politician. There is an ongoing dialogue with the British and French going on about the canal. The fact is, the treaty for the canal was due to run out in 1968 anyway, so most of the uh, most of the British and French mostly didn't think NASA was going to do anything because, well, why go to a war, risk war, risk bloodshed, uh, if you are not going to, if you're going to get it back peacefully in 12 years anyway. There is an ongoing negotiation going on. I.e. America's involved. There is a negotiation. As the British and French understand it, and as to an extent the Americans have inferred but haven't really confirmed, there is the fact that if NASA doesn't do what he's supposed to, then they're allowed to use military force. And there's also the fact that this is actually in many ways NASA doing brinkmanship because he wants money, doesn't care he's going to get it, to the Aswan Dan project and various other things. So he will either take that money in the form of a loan, which he was asking for on very charitable terms prior to taking back the dam, um, or as a payment for the, uh, for the um, canal, or as fees he's going to charge for use of the canal. What's really interesting is that, of course, these nations both have really strong links with the militaries in all the Arab nations because they've trained them, grown them, still very connected with them. And um, NASA doesn't tell anyone. In fact, doesn't even tell his own military uh, what he's going about to do. So no one really knows what's going to happen and other than NASA.
they knew the Americans about the operations the British and the French were planning. They were told it by British and French officers officially and unofficially. So they had plenty of heads up. So the first thing I would like to point out is that NASA is a bit of a problem for them. At one point, they think he's a CIA guy. They consider him a CIA agent because he's friendly with a CIA officer. He's friendly with KGB officers as well. He's friendly with everyone because it's far easier to be friendly with people than it is to be their enemy. And it's far more useful because he gets things out of them. But he never is a CIA asset. And he's never a KGB asset. He's an Egyptian asset, or rather, he's a NASA asset. I honestly think the Americans were playing a game whereby they thought if the operation went ahead and a revolution happened again, and he and NASA got overthrown by the Egyptian army and replaced with someone who was far more amenable to the West. That would be great for them. Uh, and if it there wasn't a success, and they managed to broker a peace deal or enforce a peace deal, they would also make him their friend. So, win-win for America. That was what was going on. It's, it's, it's not nice or nasty. It's real politic. It's a repeat of Korea, though, because, again, naval aviation is a critical asset, mainly because you can bring the carriers that much closer than the bases, and so they can keep up that much more of a string of air attacks and string of support for ground troops. Now, here's the problem. The rather fortunate, fortunate gentleman on, your, on the right of this picture is Winston Churchill, who casts a colossal shadow. The one on the left is Anthony Eden. Eden is a man who could have been a good Prime Minister in the 1930s. But by the 1950s had been through two world wars, and this is something you have to remember with a lot of the British leadership. They've been a lot of them have been through two world wars. They fought in World War One, they commanded and were senior ministers in World War Two. They are tired. They are overworked. They are out of energy and sat. They, even the most energetic of them has had to have multiple operations, and this is the case for Eden. But that doesn't mean the decision that Eden is making is an unpopular one. On the 2nd of August, 1955, 56, um, 55, I think, 56, yeah. It is, and it was all very familiar, it is exactly the same that we accounted from Mussolini and Hitler in those years before the war. And it goes on, then Gaskell, uh, Gaskell goes on to talk about NATO, United Nations, bringing all these things. But, and if further action, which amounted to obvious aggression by Egypt, were taken by NASA, then again different. How do I put this? It's not unpopular. They are seeing NASA as a dictator. They see him in the mold of Kaiser Wilhelm, of Hitler, of Mussolini, of Stalin, of Franco, of all those, Tito, of all the dictators they see around them. Although Tito and NASA are both quite pragmatic souls. But leaving it to one side, they see him in the mold of the dictators and the quite nasty ones they've experienced or they see around them. That's their understanding. That's their worldview. And so, to an extent, they are supportive of the government in its desire to retake the Suez Canal, to uphold the treaty against this dictator, to secure it. And this is the other problem for America. Because the Cold War is 
not yet fully underway. Propping up, they haven't yet gone to the habit of propping up dictators all around the world just because they are right way around. Although this one, because of the amount of money he's spending on Czechoslovakian equipment and the way he's acting towards Egypt, will probably not be the right way around. But this is means it's complicated for them to get involved, especially in an anti capacity. But they are also now taken on the British role of being the guarantor of last resort of the international order. It is a continuation of politics by another means in so many ways, the Suez Crisis. And it's kind of interesting how it scaled down from Operation Musketeer to our other next, uh, next to the eventual Operation Musketeer, which is implemented. If the original version had been implemented, it would have been far larger. There would have been pretty much an armored division landed, and the Egyptian army would have been annihilated as a force. But they went with a smaller one in the hopes that the larger Egyptian army would rebel against NASA and they would do their work for them. What happened? Operation Musketeer Revise. Phase 1, Air Forces gains air supremacy over Egypt's skies. Phase 2, Air Forces then to launch a 10-day aero-psychological campaign that would destroy the Egyptian economy. Which really wasn't that much to destroy in the first place, so I'm surprised they allocated 10 days for it. Sorry. It's more likely that those 10 days were about destroying the Egyptian military and making sure as much of the resistance as possible had been found and destroyed before the air and seaborne landings to capture the canal zone going. On the 8th of September 1956, six weeks after the canal had been seized, the revise, revise was approved by the British and French cabinets. As we saw in August, Gatskill had been very pro it. Even in the, on the 10th of August, again, he's saying with NATO and UN provisions. And remember, all this time, discussions going on with the Americans and the Egyptians and all sorts of things are being go talked about in the back door. And of course, the Israelis. The Royal Navy alone would provide 3rd Commander Brigade, 78 Daring Class Destroyers, 8 of the 24 Battle Class Destroyers, 4 Cruisers and HMS Manxman, the aircraft carriers Albion, Bulwark, Eagle, Ocean and Ephesius, Aircraft forming the overall majority of 16 squadrons and a total of 110 ships, including auxiliaries and ships taken up from trade. It's not a small force. And again, there is no way that can be gathered in the time it was gathered without America seeing what was happening. So please, can people stop telling me that America didn't know what Britain and France were going to do in 1956? There is absolutely no way, unless all those American officers who are based in places like Portsmouth and Plymouth, all over various airfields in the UK, on exchanges and all sorts of things that were going on in the time, and the legacies of various World War II programs, and in France, all were going around with the biggest set of blinkage and shades on known to mankind. Is though a complicated operation to manage to seize the canal intact. They're lucky. On the Suez Canal, there aren't locks. So there aren't locks to take. But there are still positions which have to be secured. So, scenario of if we're going hot, what's the base assumptions? On the Cold War scenario, whilst Sanctions from USA were likely an actual military involvement, wasn't, as I've already said. So that means for it to go hot, it has to involve the other superpower, the Soviet Union. But considering the naval presence, the predominance of the Anglo-French 
Naval Task Force vis a vis the realistic capabilities of the Soviet Navy at this point. The odds are the response would take the form of bombing rains and Britain on France. The trouble is. Any bombing raid on Britain and France is probably going to run into the American aircraft based in Britain and possibly even hit American bases, which means that America is probably going to get drawn into the war on Britain's side. Which is an interesting scenario because I can see NATO versus Warsaw in this period. NATO is not the organization it is today, and it's certainly not in terms of the cohesive organization is today. Remember, in practicality, SHAPE had existed for four years. By this point, the Secretary General for three years. By the time 1956 really won the long. Because whilst they're formed in 1951 and 1952, it takes them about a year to get organized and get to a point where they start actually able to function as they're intended. So, you can't really go, yes, this is a functioning organization. So why would the Soviets enter the war? Well, let's go back to that again. If you can drive Britain and France from NATO, damage them and split NATO, in any way, shape or form, You've won. Also, they can show how good an ally they are to other nations who are considering resisting America and other Western powers. They can strengthen their position in Europe. They can secure their position in the Middle East. They can look like the good guys, standing up against imperial aggressors. Plus, these nations that they've been taking on are not the big powers in their minds. They're declining imperial powers. The reality is they are capable, but they're not thinking that way. As I said, the Soviet arsenal is really not that strong. In fact, you have that aircraft, which is, I know, still in service, in a version in the Chinese Air Force as the Badger and various other things, but... Yep. Yeah. And the Svold of class cruisers. You don't really have a massively capable Soviet military. But they can do things, but they're just not going to be ronking, stomping Soviet armor, armed forces. So, the question is what happens? Would the war end up in Germany? Well, if you've got Russia attacking British citizen positions. If West Germany declares itself neutral, that's great. How long before the response from Britain and France to the bombing attacks lead to the Soviet troops in the Eastern German sector deciding to advance on the British and French sectors in Germany? I'll leave it up to you. It, 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 it'll be tit for tat, but it could well evolve. Would more nations get drawn in? Of course they would. Bombing going on in the Europe, that's going to happen. Would it escalate to nuclear weapons? I'd hope not, but... Any Cold War going hot has that potential. Would it stop? Well, that's the interesting thing. It could peter out, because... Yes, the Warsaw Pact has been formed. And yes, NATO has existed a while. But the infrastructure in 1956 is still pretty freaking terrible. Supplying forces. A long way from home. 
And that was why the Soviet advance petered out where it did in World War II, because really their logistics couldn't go any further. But it's the same with the Allied. So, honestly, I don't see it going that far, because logistics is still under tremendous pressure. So that might well stop it. Anyway. That's a long patrol on Suez going hot. I know it's not that long. In fact, it's about as long as a normal introduction video, but... I hope it answers the questions. Enjoy. Take care. And thank you for watching. Remember, if you did like, please subscribe. Well, press the like button first, but then subscribe and maybe press the little bell down below. Thank you to all my Discord members. Thank you to all my patrons. Thank you to everyone who watches these videos. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't for you. Thank you. Now, normally, that would be where we would finish the episode and finish the long patrol. But the joy of being your own producer, editor, and everything else means that if you go to bed and you think, I'd like to add something to that, you can. Now, with the assistance of the fluffy research assistant, who is currently next to me, demanding pats, I'm going to do a little bit more of a discussion because I realized I made some comments about NASA and I need to talk about him a bit more because he does deserve to be talked about a bit more. Now, President NASA, Gamal Abdel Lasser, as I've said, pretty much the best and most um, best politician of the region for during the Cold War. But he's also a very, very pragmatic politician. He is in no way a friend of... ...to what he wants for himself as well. So, yes, very much a personal rule. Um, he appoints... In 1956. Well, he has to, he goes through different titles, but technically he is the one running the government. He's always the one running the government. Between 1952, the government in, in... The president is Mohammed Nagib, and he's a very, very nice guy, but he's... He has nowhere near the political power or the influence or sway as NASA does. He's very much... I wouldn't... They're seizing control of the canal, and he hasn't even told Nagib. Then Nagib really is sort of going, eh? oh, "Yes, we are. Yes, we are." Um, and also, I would, I, I think, pass the issue again for the navy and for it's looking at Egypt and it's looking at the, and the army and British forces when they're looking at the uh, Suez Crisis and they're looking about they're planning out their invasion.
are as happy about the trying to overthrow NASA. And everyone who's ever even checked who of you. And two. is a very difficult, difficult position to go through. But no, NASA, very, very interesting guy. And a very powerful leader. As I said, at different points, lots of different agencies thought he was their agent just because he was their friend. The CIA particularly thought it was. Invited the CIA officer around to, uh, to around on the weekend to play golf and various other things. I think the first version is, I'd say more NASA wanted someone who would actually be stupid enough to play a decent game of golf. Everyone else would always try and lose. Or maybe the American officer also tried to lose and therefore NASA had a bit of fun uh, watching how badly he could play. I could imagine NASA doing that. I could get into a bit more about Anthony Eden, but I really don't want to talk more about Anthony Eden because <sighs> by the time the Suez Crisis, part of the British polit body political are spent forces. They don't look like it, maybe on acting energetically and all sorts of things, but it's kind of like The rest of the people, they have been sucked dry during World War II. They know how to continue to work as, know how to deal with the world as it changes. If you're going to roll this, I'm going to have to pick you up. <sighs> Hello. Anyway. Um. So they can't do that. They cannot adapt to the scenario they're facing. I love you. Right. You're going to keep rolling off the bed. You have to stand my lap. And that's the trouble for Anthony. Eden. That's what happens to Britain. This is. I'd say half the reason that Britain ends up in the situation it does in the 1960s and 70s is because our leadership, our political class, are such a spent force after two world wars and all the others. They really need to get out of their posts and go away, but they don't want to go because they don't trust anyone else after those two world wars to take over and not run into the same issues, especially the Cold War. And I would argue this is why you get end up with Mrs. Thatcher in leadership. Love her or hate her, but she's probably one of the most dynamic prime ministers we'd had in a long while at that point when she does get power. And the reason is because she wasn't a spent force. Whereas the others were. Which is thankful because then we had the Falklands and honestly I'm not or how the rest would have dealt with the Falklands. No, you rolled off the bed twice. But also, the interesting thing about the uh, about Suez is it's the first time you have a helicopter assault. And what's really interesting is we don't often talk about the effect of Suez on tactics and operations, but what the 3rd Commando Brigade gets up to in terms of the helicopter assault and all these things, really does have a big impact on Western doctrine, and it's what leads to the air, well, air cavalry in the Vietnam War, because the Americans see how effective 
the British helicopter forces have been. And inarguably, therefore, is the legacy which is still running our forces and leading to what we're building to this day. Nope. So there is a long-term impact of Suez. It has this big impact in that heliborne forces, vast forces, are seen to overweigh the situation. But I do think this is overplayed because they're doing it after the British, after ten days of their saturation air attack. And whilst you cannot deliver democracy and all these things from thirty thousand feet, you just can't bomb people into submission. It doesn't seem to work. What you can do but using air power to soften up your enemy and then launching the ground troops, that's a well not well worn practice. Because after all it's a continuation of the traditional bombard, then send in your ground troops. Basically it's treating aircraft air power as a form of long range artillery. Which I know some air power theorists will really, really hate. When you're doing that, you're basically, your aircraft are just long range artillery. What's also interesting is the sheer number of very strong destroyers. Destroyers which were built at the end with, uh, with World War II legacy in mind, but are really in many ways taking the role of the cruiser. For this operation, the cruisers taking the role of the battleship, the big heavy hitters, and hence the cruisers are held off. The idea is very much not to use the cruisers unless you need to. Because of the risk of civilian damage. Very different scenario to the previous operations in World War II, where the threat of the enemy was sufficient that overwhelming In this case, air power had been used to break the enemy, to break their infrastructure, to break their backs, to enable them. And then they were able to land. And Please, again, it is an Anglo-French operation, but supplying 110 ships, plus, of course, there are French ships on top of that and all sorts of things, uh, it's very much an Anglo-led operation. And there is a reason for this. Why are the British and the French so worried about the Suez Canal? Well, it comes back to the Cold War, and it comes back to the Far East. Britain has all these commitments around the world, and honestly, if the Suez crisis hadn't happened, if Britain had still had, felt it had free, reg ready access to the Suez Canal, and it was stable, one has to wonder if the the um, west of Suez, uh, the east of Suez decision would have ever happened, because the costs that losing the Suez impose on you doing your duty to your presence in the world is massive. It becomes a far greater logistical problem. It becomes a far greater economic issue. And also, as I said, the Americans were playing to win. And actually, you can argue that the way they won, they lost. Because Britain and France, a decade or so later, are both doing their own versions of retreating east from Suez. So America has to take on the sole burden of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and the global policeman role. And whilst they were happy to do it during the Cold War, nowadays I think they're looking at it going, wow, this has been very expensive. 
in up until 1956 you could argue that whilst america by that point post second world war had probably achieved primus into paris of the world policeman britain and france were very high up there behind it meaning in korea korean war Royal is a major component of that war the British Armed Forces are a major component of that war. Korea had never been British territory. Korea wasn't even ours after that. It didn't involve in the, during the Pacific War. Korea, when the Chinese uh, mainland, the communist Chinese, threatened to invade Taiwan not long after they, they'd succeeded in conquering the mainland, it was British destroyers, daring class destroyers, which had raced into the Straits daring, before the Americans, before anyone else got there, there was a British destroyer on the scene. It wasn't therefore America conduct, confronting Russia, it was Britain confronting China, and it was therefore, it could be said to be being kept lower. In risk. America was trying to get to have its cake and eat it. It wanted the American leadership wanted to be they're all powerful. They wanted to have their allies go in the world where they wanted them, but they also, in the case of Suez, didn't want to back up the British and French because they thought they were losing, so they try they pulled them back. The British and French had got control of the canal. They'd beaten up the Egyptian army, but there had been no revolution. Nasser hadn't lost his post. There had been no overthrow of the government. And that's what I say. When you look at their aim, Operation Musketeer, revi revised Musketeer versus Operation Musketeer. Musketeer was going for an all-out defeat of the Egyptian forces, basically reconquest. Revise is looking for a revolution. When that doesn't happen, the Americans then pull the plug and pull back. The trouble was, yes, NASA ends up getting his Aswan Dam, but he doesn't exactly become America's friend because they pull us, uh, pull the French, British and French back. In fact, in many ways, he goes the other way. Why? Because the Cold War doesn't matter, and this is the big problem in understanding the Middle East. When you're British, or when you, well, no, when you're more American at that time, because I think the British and the French had an idea about it, at least you can suggest that from the way the British were handling, setting up, set, setting up what became CENTO and various other groups. The idea that the cold war was not all that was not the important factor in their decision making it was mood music going on in the background it's something which cannot be overstated anyway i hope you found the additions useful i have to get someone downstairs for his breakfast I'm going to add this on to the end of the video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Once again, if you like the videos, please do subscribe. Please do press the little bell down below so you get a notification when I have these videos. Please also like them. That's always fun. But we also have a Discord group, uh, which your link is down below. And I have a Patreon page if you're feeling very generous and kind. And that's very critical to me because that's currently my book allowance which during covid has been very very critical anyway thank you very much hope you enjoyed it hope you found it useful and um have a nice day